Who is he? Makarov. Today we look to rewrite the story of 2023's Modern Warfare 3. This will be a direct sequel to 2022's Modern Warfare 2. For this video, we need to forget Modern Warfare 3 as we know it and think of it as a brand new story. This also isn't a sequel to the Modern Warfare 2 rewritten that we did as that was a story created by a friend of the channel named Sean and he is currently working on his vision for Modern Warfare 3. So this is my vision for Modern Warfare 3 as it stands. The game opens up with Captain Price, Gas, Soap McTavish, and Simon Ghost Riley being summoned to a clandestine meeting with Kate Laswell and CIA operatives in London. The intel there suggests that Vladimir Makarov, long considered a rogue element, has been gathering resources and followers across Eastern Europe. During their briefing, the meeting is abruptly interrupted by a surprise attack. Makarov's Kani group launches a coordinated strike across multiple European cities. Task Force 141 scrambles to defend the intelligent headquarters while evacuating key personnel. However, the attack is only a diversion from Makarov's true motives. Vladimir would publicly take credit for the attacks and vow that more assaults were coming, leaving Task Force 141 disavowed and on their own due to the fact that Makarov's attacks make it appear that he has inside knowledge of Western intelligence operations, casting suspicious on Task Force 141. The attack suggests that there might be a leak or a compromised operative within the unit or its affiliated organizations. Political leaders and intelligence agencies are pressured to distance themselves from Task Force 141 to avoid further fallout and prevent diplomatic incidents, leading to the unit being temporarily disavowed and cut off from official support. As this is going on, Gary Roach Sanderson, who has been covertly operating in Asia for several years, receives a distress call from Kate Laswell. Roach is also an old friend of Captain Price, and Roach prepares a safe house for Task Force 141 to regroup located in Urzikstan. Once in Urzikstan, they learn from Roach and Alex Keller, who joins the team after Gas personally called him and asked for extra help, that Makarov has plans far beyond local attacks. He seeks to destabilize Europe, creating a power vacuum for his ultra-nationalist forces to fill. The team plans an infiltration of a key ultranationalist stronghold in St. Petersburg to gather intel on Makarov's network. Roach plays a pivotal role during the operation, utilizing his demolition skills to secure key positions while Alex coordinates tactical maneuvers. Their next mission takes the team to Paris, where Makarov's Kani group has smuggled a bomb into the city. Task Force 141 must locate and disarm the device before it detonates, causing mass casualties and economic collapse. Captain Price, Soap, Ghost, and Roach lead the ground assault, moving through the narrow streets and alleys of the city, while Alex Gaz handle the tactical command and intelligence coordination. As the situation escalates, the team is able to intercept the bomb and disarm it before it goes off. However, Alex and Gas infiltrate Connie's comms and uncover a potential weapons facility belonging to Makarov located in Kazakhstan. Captain Price, Roach, and Gas travel to Kazakhstan to find this rumored weapons facility. The objective is to infiltrate the facility and destroy any weapons that Makarov has acquired. Oh, ah! The team discovers that Makarov has been stockpiling nuclear material and is planning to hijack a Russian ballistic missile submarine. Meanwhile, Laswo got her hands on some intel that suggests that Makarov planned to strike a oil refinery in Saudi Arabia as he aimed to disrupt the global oil supply and trigger an economic crisis. Ghost, Soap, and Alex must defend the refinery and stop the Kani group from planting explosives and causing a worldwide panic. After successfully thwarting Makarov's plan, the whole team regrouped to discuss what Price, Roach, and Gas found in Kazakhstan. As Makarov launches a bold assault to seize control of the Russian ballistic missile submarine stationed in the Baltic Sea, Task Force 141 has no choice but to launch an underwater assault to stop Makarov from gaining control of the nuclear arsenal located on that submarine. Roach, Ghost, and Alex attempt to stop Makarov from taking the submarine, but they ultimately fail as they are pushed back by Makarov's Kani group. The team then tracks Makarov to his coastal stronghold in Kamchatka, Russia. The facility heavily fortified holds critical data on Makarov's global network and his final endgame plan. In the final mission, Task Force 141 launches an all-out assault on Makarov's stronghold. The stronghold is a repurposed military base built into the cliffs with the Russian ballistic missile submarine docked in an underground port. Makarov's men are 
are preparing for a nuclear launch that will frame the West for an attack on Russian soil, igniting a global conflict. Task Force 1 for 1 begins the mission with an intense assault on the coastal defenses. Roach, Ghost, Soap, and Alex lead the charge, using a combination of stealth and force to neutralize the outer guard towers and anti-air defenses. They move through the cliffs under heavy fire, making their way towards the main entrance. Along the way, Roach leads to the demolition of key infrastructures to create distractions, while Alex coordinates with Nikolai, who is on air support, to take out enemies from above. Once inside the base, the team splits up. Soap and Roach head towards the submarine docks, where they must disable the propulsion and guidance systems to prevent the launch. Ghost and Alex provide cover, engaging the Connie group in a brutal firefight through the narrow corridors of the facility. Tensions build as Soap and Roach race against the clock, navigating through the dark industrial maze of the submarine docks. They plant explosives on critical systems and narrowly avoid detection by Makarov's patrol. Meanwhile, Ghost and Alex continue to hold off waves of enemies, buying them time. And just as Soap and Roach disable the submarine systems, alarms sound throughout the base. Makarov realizes what's happening and orders his men to kill Price and the rest of Task Force 1 for 1. With the submarine disabled, Price and Gaz regroup with Soap, Roach, and Alex and Ghost. The team fight their way towards Makarov's command center deep within the base. As they ascend, a staircase lined with thick metal doors, they come under heavy fire. Explosions rock the facility and the stronghold begins to collapse from earlier sabotage efforts. Time is now running out. Ghost, Soap, Roach, and Alex provide cover fire for Captain Price and Sergeant Gaz as they push towards Makarov's location. Captain Price and Gaz breach Makarov's command center, which is a large, dimly lit room with massive steel doors and windows overlooking the stormy coast. Makarov stands at the far end alongside Andrei Nolan, who is his second in command. Both men are surrounded by monitors that are displaying live feeds from across the globe. Makarov turns as Price and Gaz enter the the room. Makarov begins to taunt Price about the failure of Western governments, accusing them of causing the very chaos that has led to this moment. Makarov explains his vision for the future, one of global destabilization where only the strong survive and the world falls into a new order under his control. Makarov pulls a hidden knife and he lunges at Captain Price, beginning a fierce hand-to-hand -hand fight while Gaz engages in a fight against Nolan, who attempted to take out his pistol. During the fight, Gaz would be shot in the leg and Price would get the upper hand on Makarov. However, Nolan was approaching Price to shoot him in the back of the head, but right before pulling the trigger, Gaz shot Nolan from across the room, saving Captain Price. However, this would distract Price, who is stabbed by Makarov in the abdomen. With the adrenaline running high, Price pulls the knife from his stomach and slices Makarov's throat. The ultranationalist stumbles back, clutching his throat, blood pouring everywhere. He falls to his knees and is gasping for a breath before he finally collapses. Price stands over him, and the silence is deafening. Moments later, Ghost, Soap, Roach, and Alex burst into the room and find Captain Price and Gas on the floor with Makarov and Nolan dead. They assess the situation quickly and exfil as they look to give Price and Gas help. The story picks up a few weeks later as Price and Gas are recuperating from their injuries. Laswell is visiting Price and lets him know that Task Force 1 for 1 has been cleared and reinstated due to their efforts in stopping Makarov. With Makarov defeated and Task Force 1 for 1 reinstated, Alex returns to Urzikstan to be with Farah and Roach is officially assigned to Task Force 1 for 1 as a permanent member. Price reflects on the cost of their victory, knowing the world will always need men like them to fight in the shadows, as he thanks Gas for saving his ass. Now the game ends with a post credit scene in Urzikstan, where Farah is found bloodied and on the floor as she yells for Alex, who we see is being dragged out of their home, unconscious. Farah passes out and she whispers the name, Captain. <laughs> And so here ends my version of Modern Warfare 3. Now, the reason that I made this story was just because I've been wanting to make it for a while. Um, you guys had been asking for a rewrite of this uh, particular game. And I thought that maybe if we could make this game more grounded, sort of like Modern Warfare 1 was, Modern Warfare 2019. And instead of making it this big, global, crazy thing, it could be more story focused, more linear more focus on the task force and its core members.
members include Gary Roach Sanderson and just kind of see how it would go bring Alex back into the fold and make him a prominent player in the story these are the type of things that I really wanted to dive into and explore during this rewrite I didn't want to bring Farah in I didn't want to bring in Los Vaqueros in for no reason I didn't want to bring back Commander Graves or the Shadow Company I didn't want to bring General Shepard into this I wanted to keep it grounded and focused you know what I'm saying I think that's where the problem was there was no focus in the previous game or in the actual Modern Warfare 3 game that we got and I wanted to just give the story more focus more linear uh, pathway so you guys can maybe understand the story better as it's going I, I didn't really want to do flashbacks and all that craziness I really wanted to have it as a almost as a self-contained story and really explore the toll that the war has been taken on prize explore the friendships that are in the task Force one for one and the brotherhood make it feel more like a ghost unit that I felt that the Call of Duty ghost game had they felt like a real family I wanted to make this uh, version of task Force one for one in MW3 feel more like a family and I wanted Makarov to just be ruthless and obviously if this would be an actual game you would make these missions bigger and you would show Makarov killing certain people Makarov getting the upper hand how Price is struggling with everything how the team is adjusting all these things is what I wanted to make Modern Warfare 3. If it doesn't seem as grandiose as something that is, you know, out of this world, then that was my point. I wanted to keep it small, contained, and linear. And now the post credit scene, if you guys have any questions about that, the reason that I include that is because Modern Warfare 2019 started with Alex Keller, right? And it started with Urzikstan. And if there would have been an MW4, what if we turned it into something about Alex Keller? What if we made it more about Alex and, you know, we could bring in some other characters that have held some vendettas against him. Maybe there you could bring back general shepherd and you know make this story more focused on that we could explore maybe the relationship with farah and alex more deeply how we were doing in the first game and the game could be about trying to rescue alex or maybe more alex focus where we see him getting tortured and we try to escape and all this craziness i don't know right that's a whole other thing that you can get into the post credit scene was just something fun that i wanted to throw in there it has no real meaning and i do not plan to write a story around that i just wanted to put that out there as like a fun little thing and so because we put it out there, if you guys are interested, who do you think was dragging Alex in the post credit scene out of their home? Who do you think attacked Urzikstan? And who do you think attacked Ara? It'd be pretty cool to see your thoughts on that and who you think was behind the attack in the post credit scene.